All right. Hello, everyone. It is hey, January hey. 11th, 2018. We're all back in the house for SEO Unmasked, number 21. Glad 21. to have you with us. I'm Garrett Groff. I'm Vin Deletta. Steve Brownlee. Yeah, 21. The weeks just keep going by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Glad to be back. We had a little bit of a downtime over the yeah. past uh, month. Happy New Year from me. It's my first time uh, yeah, back this year. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's Garrett, the only one who's made every single episode. I think he <laughs> might be. It, well, there can't be an episode without me. <laughs> How did you get to watch uh, you and, and Jared last week? How'd that go? Uh, it went pretty good. Talked I enjoyed the episode, actually. It was really good. I, I love when Jared's on the show, actually. He's, uh, he's pretty entertaining, and <laughs> he, he brings, up a of, uh, brings up a lot of cool points that uh, I don't understand, but fair play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he knows his stuff. He does, yeah. Yeah, that's on our link to these guys, too. Oh, for sure. Um, so, big news item today is the 24 Hours of SEO is coming up. Um, just in a couple weeks here, I will paste the chat, or I'll paste the links in the chat for everybody if you haven't heard about it yet. Um, Steve already has one of the shirts even. I think the new shirts are actually going to be nicer in that one, right? Yeah, this is uh, this is just a draft print from, um, I think I got like the cheapest one on Vistaprint next day just to make sure the, the, the logo and everything was going to print nicely. So the, uh, the real stuff is going to be on the premium tees and... Uh, Selection of logos, much nicer quality. Cool. Well, yeah. Did you figure out what what brand are we using for the t-shirts? It's Teespring. Oh, cool. Yeah, because they have the charity supported already. So, basically, the way we're set up now, we don't have to take any money at all. The donations are going straight on Just Giving. Teespring sends the money straight to the St. Jude's as well. So mm -hmm. we don't have to handle any tax forms, any deductions it's just all going straight to the charity so nice, obviously nice. that's good for trust as well because you know in this industry you know I know we're not like that but nice. you know some people are in this industry so everyone can trust that you know Teespring and Just Giving are handling their money well and it's going straight to St. Jude's yeah um, oh, I'll make sure the links are in the video I just pasted them in the chat now for everybody um, let me get we'll run through the names I did it quick so far we got Mike Blumenthal from Get Five Stars. He's a pretty awesome local guy. I've been following for a while, and I think quite another, uh, quite many other people do too. Um, he's kind of an authoritative guy on local search and stuff beyond that. So that should be a good chat. Um, David Markovich from Online Geniuses. Sam Romain is going to be in from Dominate with SEO, talking about online reputation management and how to do it properly. Um, Joe Sinkwitz from Intellifluence. Paul Shapiro. Dan Taylor. A lot of people, um, Zach Hayes, Craig Road, Andy Holiday, Vin's going to be on, Steve's going to be on, I'll be here ranting and all sorts of fun stuff. Mark Preston, um, there are yeah, some book, other people his that... Really, his book's really interesting, actually. I've only, um, only just uh, grabbed it, but uh, it's the business side of SEO, and I think that's what he's going to be talking a lot about as well, just the, uh, the ways of thinking and the ways of planning SEO so that it's successful uh, business-wise, not just... Uh, this rise is the best. L let me ask you, Garrett. Who moved me to 1 a.m.? <laughs> who moved me to the Steve, 1 a.m.? Steve, Steve did, because... Oh, uh, yeah, you can't take you can't take up one of the good slots. So I moved both of us to the uh, graveyard slots, Ben. I think... Uh, well, we're going to be there for the whole 24 hours anyway. We've got to give the uh, good slots to... Uh, All right. The good slots go to the Nick Eubanks of this world. And, uh, you get the graveyard slot. <laughs> Did Nick take a spot yet? I gotta, I gotta mess he up. didn't, no, yeah, you'll have to check with him what one he wants. Oh, that's I right. Nick he, good one left. He, uh, he just announced that they acquired a, a few new agencies, so uh, yeah. might be a little busy. We'll say that. Um, as we speak, Trevor Chueca that's been on the show with us, he's going to come on and talk about um, his experience organizing, and he organizes a tweet stock up in Canada, a pretty big conference for Twitter and stuff like that. So he's going to be talking, you know, the work that goes into that and what he's learned from managing it from, I think it's his third year coming up. So, yeah, I'm sure like anybody starting something from new, a lot of stuff to learn, mistakes to make and oh, that solutions cool. to problems. So that'd be interesting for anyone that's interested in that stuff. And 
Yeah, what time slots he grabbed? Um, I just gave him a link, so oh. I don't know if you like just right now. I'm talking to him. T Two a.m. is really good. Right after then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll have to get some more people over in Europe to. Well, I got that one British guy. Or Thailand or something. Uh, he's picked uh, picked four a.m. Um, in the UK, so you can do it before work. So it's not even working that UK people want the really bad slots. There. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, right on. Yeah, um, actually, I was just going to say some people in Thailand. I bet we can uh, rustle up a few more diverse people. I think I got a couple ideas about topics that we haven't got on the list yet. Yeah, we need a little bit more black hat. At least two black hat. Yeah. Because we've got one. We need at least another one, I think. Yeah. We'll find them. I'll, I'll uh, start asking around again tomorrow. Get see who wants to get involved. But yeah, we we set a goal, fifteen thousand bucks for St. Jude's. Plus, uh, um, you, you can buy sweatshirts, t-shirts, and I think a couple other accessories. So, why not? Um, so, so are the uh, is the swag the primary way of raising money, or can people? No, don't donations are the primary way of raising money. So, um, Garrett and I have got it started. Um, Reach Creator, because obviously we're one of the sponsors. We've um, donated five hundred dollars. I've given a hundred um, of my own money as well. Um, hopefully some of the speakers will um, donate on just giving as well obviously that'll be optional and for them, I, but... I just signed up another one so um, Courtney Marie I can't remember her last name I'm sorry Courtney um, she was out at Ungagged uh, we didn't get a chance to meet up but that's how we met was through Ungagged um, she's going to be talking about growing her agency and uh, a woman's perspective of doing something in a space that is obviously very much infiltrated by men and maybe not the Nicest group of men to deal with in the world regarding that. So, <laughs> That's it. Um, she's going to be on talking about her experiences and growing her own agency. I know she has a couple brands, which, sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I think, I want to say it's fashion stuff. I might be wrong, but obviously she can uh, offer a lot of pointers in that arena too. So great to have her. Um, is there anything else about the event that is pressing? No, I mean, the most important thing is just to get on the 24hoursofseo.com website, um, get registered, because there's going to be special messages from the speakers. There's going to be free things they're giving away in terms of ebooks, information. Obviously, you're going to get first access to the schedule ahead of everyone else. You're going to get first access to questions for the speakers because we'll do questions submitted by registered people first and then the live Q&A. So you can jump the queue and get your questions straight to the speakers. So get on and get registered first. That's the best way to get involved with the event. And we'll send you all the information you need to get the most out of it. Yeah. Cool. And you'll, also get, and you'll also get the super nice um, recording of the video split into each speaker and properly categorized sent to you as well. Um, whereas obviously it'll the whole thing will always be on YouTube, but it'd be much easier for you to just get those individual video um, files down. I was looking there. My, all right, so what's going to happen is YouTube has like a cut of live streaming, but it's way more than 24 hours. But what they do with that 24 hour recording is they're automatically going to break it up into videos on their own, which I think are going to be either two or three hours each. So at least that way, then you still have, you know, eight to twelve videos or whatever to watch. So, yeah, it'll be good either way. Yeah. But uh, cool. Uh, moving on, just case study update. Um, the the candle site finally stuck for two keywords in the, <laughs> in the forties and the fifties. And uh, go, go go Shopify. So From, yeah. So did we talk about what the issue was, or did you and Jared talk? Um, about Jared that talked. Yeah, we did talk about it, and Shopify okay. is not cool. I think I decided I'm probably going to move away from it at some point. Yeah. Um, but it, right now, it's just I think it might be a matter of Google may may not have indexed um, the 20 or so links that we built over the last two months. But I would think I would think they have. From what I can tell, the site has been crawled properly, but. Still with Shopify, unless you're like a super beginner to selling anything online, I don't think I can recommend it over just using WordPress and WooCommerce. Yeah, I think WooCommerce is uh, yeah. the way to go for SEO. Um, I mean, you're paying twenty nine dollars a month for Shopify, so that's rounded up to three hundred sixty bucks ish, three hundred fifty bucks. 
Um, it's like a one-time fee for WooCommerce. And with Shopify, you can't touch anything. I can't touch a robots.txt file. You can't ask for it to be edited. Um, you can't edit your HD access files or um, what's the other one? Let them, your sitemap, your XML sitemap, you can't edit that. And they have some yeah. weird default file that doesn't make any sense. So it's like. It's kind of amazing that, that a big uh, e commerce platform like that would kind of handcuff you, you know, as far as a marketing channel, um, you know, in, in that way. You know, know, yeah, you'd think they'd want to attract more people like me where it would be cool to just point and click shit. And if I need to edit stuff, I can still edit it. I mean, Jared brought up a good point, and I kind of agree with him, where it probably is a lot of basic beginner users where they shouldn't have access to that stuff, but at least, why can't I go in the live chat and be like, I'm going to copy-paste over my robots.txt file, can you replace it after you make sure it's not going to kill your server or something? I don't, you know, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I, I don't know. I can see Yeah, I mean, I think uh, quite a few of the uh, self-build... Uh, platforms um i'm forgetting like wix and what are the other ones squarespace and they all have quite heavy restrictions on what you can do um i think really for builders and people doing your own sites garrett's right and jared's right um i think you're better off in wordpress um yeah i think vin said that as well i mean i think um, it's just one you know we moan about wordpress but really for speed there isn't a better option because the quicker and easier ones have all these problems and the slower and more difficult ones, you don't get to get stuck into just getting on with it quickly enough. So at the minute, you know, if you just and want to make and money. Sh Shopify doesn't have like some kind of self-hosted option where you don't even, you're going to have to bother with their crap? I honestly don't know. Um, not, but if they do, it would be enterprise or something. Um, I don't think they sell that kind of thing to normal people. <laughs> it's not open source. They're not going to give you their code and put it on, their, on your own server. It's a, it's a full SaaS. You, there's no self-hosting. Um, it sounds like with Shopify, you can just use some short code for buy buttons. Um, you yeah. can't actually do a self-hosted, from what I'm reading no. in this forum post. So No, you can't. It's a SaaS. Yeah. They, uh, it's all closed source code. Well, I'm sure they use open source code in there, but it's, they're not going to give you their code. Right. Anyway, um, yeah, I just I was gonna say one more thing. Oh yeah, one one thing that I, I'm pretty sure Jared and I covered is with their payment processing tool on Shopify. Um, they'll process it for you and put it straight in your business banking account or your personal account if you're gonna do that. Um, no big deal. It's competitive with PayPal, like two point something percent. But if you wanted to still use PayPal, they would still charge Shopify's 3% or 2.9 on top of you're going to be paying PayPal another 3%. So it's that can really add up if you want to use Stripe or you know, I don't know. I guess with Shopify's own solution, you might as well just use it, but it's something to consider. Yeah, that's pretty mad. Anyways, I think that's it for my updates, unless you guys have anything off the radar to talk about. No, no, not right now. Cool. I'm reading this first uh, news article, it's pretty uh -huh. funny. <laughs> yeah, so I was on Adweek, and um, Ikea has an uh, awesome new ad out where um, you rip it out of the magazine or wherever the hell it's in. And if you're a woman and you think you're pregnant, you can pee on it. And if it comes back positive, you can go to Ikea and get a discount on a crib. It's pretty, it's pretty freaking awesome, man, as far as... I mean, this is the first interactive content that I've seen offline. And that's, you know, what it is. We always talk about interactive yeah. articles and... You know, Steve was talking um, about. The, I think uh, it is very interesting. I don't know my exact position on it, but what? what how would you like to be the cashier? And you know, you know, this this person brings up a crib, and you, it's like uh, another one of these pea-soaked uh, coupons. Huh? <laughs> 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 and then what do they do with them? Do they put them in a box and let them reek up the the, the whole store? 
<laughs> well, I mean, it's going to be it's going to be dry when they bring it in. I mean, you're not going to bring it oh. in dripping wet. Are you? Like, <laughs> no, I mean, still, it's like, yeah. so I'm just curious. I don't know if it's actually a big deal like I'm making it out to be, but. Well, I, I think this kind of thing just kind of opens up. Um, I mean, I must admit, I assumed that, that you would just take a picture of it, not bring the actual paper in. But I guess there's a box to fill in on there, so it looks like they might actually want the pee paper bringing in to IKEA. Uh, it's kind of <laughs> weird. Yeah, but I, I'm interested in seeing what what other ad agencies do now that that this has been out as far as other interactive content in print. You know, because this is pretty cool. When was the last time you actually like looked at an advertisement in a magazine and actually paid attention to it? I don't remember the last time I read a magazine. <laughs> yeah, I, I read them on the plane. The good ideas. Yeah, yeah, I read on the I read on the plane. Yeah, so. Yeah. But then I always intend to read it. Like I pick up a couple of free magazines in the lounge, put them in my bag, um, get to the hotel at the other end, and throw them away because <laughs> yeah. I've slept the whole way across. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting, nonetheless. Um, yeah, I, I don't think this would fly in the U.S., but <laughs> oh, it's, it's cool only over in Norway or Sweden or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm not even going to say what I think would happen in the U.S. Let's move along quickly. <laughs> uh, yeah, next agenda item here on the, the news, uh, Barry at the round table. New Google con Search Console is rolling out with 16 months of data, so things are going to be extended quite a bit. Um, you know, as always, taking the data in Search Console, you got to take it with a grain of salt, but it, it also kind of sounded like things... Might be a little more detailed, but I don't know. I don't use it a whole lot to begin with, so shall see. Yeah, it looked like they had some cool new features on there. I, I saw they added something with Google Fetch. Let me see what, uh, what it is here. Like te test robots, fetch, uh, views of search results, submit to index. Oh. You know, all those little tools are really helpful. Yeah, I mean, the main one I use is the structured data markup tool because. Um, Whenever you know, it's always it's not something we do very often. So whenever I do it, I'm always convinced that I'll definitely do something wrong. So I always, I always check it on the tool. But uh, so far, it's been quite easy. Um, everything's gone fine. But I think that's kind of a cool tool because you could do, you could do it wrong and you would never know because you, it doesn't show up to you when you're visiting the site. Yeah. Um, so tools like that, I think, are super cool. And I think all their page speed tools are awesome. So I think Google's got loads of cool stuff for webmasters to use if they want to take advantage of it. I think you can get a lot of benefit from paying attention to what they're giving away in inverted commas. Did you guys see this and in, in, uh, rolled out for your sites yet, or is it still available? <laughs> I think, like, the only one of our sites I actually have in webmaster tools is the case study site? The case study site, and I think um, our technology blog is in there, but I like honestly just never look at it unless something's yeah. wrong with the site. I'm really, <laughs> I'm really bad at that. I just don't look at it very often. No, I, I, so. I still have, uh, I still have the old one. I don't know why. Well, we we went through a phase where we uh, dumped all of Google's products, so we didn't use yeah. Gmail, we didn't use Analytics, we didn't use. Um, yeah. You know, I burned, I burned my Android phone. Uh, but yeah, d during that time, it, it, there was a real, very real reason to do that because yeah, it was getting a bit out of hand. Some of the stuff that you were seeing, like you know, someone sent a tweet and all of his clients and his webmaster tools account got banned and stuff, and they wouldn't have been able to know that they were all his clients unless he had them on his webmaster tools. So, right. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I don't know. I mean, Mac maybe, just maybe, a little maybe, yeah. Maybe it was exaggerated by the uh, yeah. industry journals and stuff, so I don't want to say it definitely happened. Oh, no, no, something funny happened today. Um, mildly funny, I guess. Matt Diggity, his, his main website is diggitymarketing.com, and Stephen Kang noticed, he runs the SEO Signals Lab group on Facebook, that mattdiggity.com forwards to mattcuts.com all of a sudden. And... Is, I guess the, the irony of it is, you know, Matt does PBNs and whatever games he was yeah. on. Why would he be forwarding his own site to Matt Cuts? And uh, Jared, I talked to Jared, and um, we had an agreement that, oh, maybe it's just like PR stunt doing it for links or something, because why would he be doing that? But then um, 
it also came to my attention. Maybe he actually doesn't own MattDiggity.com because it's just his online persona. Uh, you know, it's not his real name. And it's not dig- his real name. No. Yeah, Diggity Marketing, and he just never bothered to buy it. And then Stephen finally said he talked to Matt. Someone else is just playing a little joke on him or something. But funny, it's ironic, whatever the words are for it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I keep saying we all need ridiculous fake names. It sounds like you already have one thought up for yourself. <laughs> Well, no, I was just thinking about yours. I mean, you could just be, you could just be, you could just be Viggity. Well, <laughs> making that vague I mean, all day long. The whole thing is, when you're looking at nicknames, you have to look at the prompt efficiency bonus. <laughs> and if it's not truly enough, it just doesn't work out. And <laughs> I can't believe Garrett won this week with those b- bizarre, bizarre words of the day. If you want to suggest a word of the day, just uh, let me know and I'll uh, get it on the show. Um, Wait, did, he SD, just, did he just drop SD, a word of the day? He got, he got both oh. of them. He got the word and the phrase. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I spelled Very truly good. wrong and then Steve's like, oh, Turley. That's a, that's a good one. <laughs> Yeah, Turley, Turley was a Garrett typo, and prompt efficiency bonus was um, from some bizarre email we received. <laughs> um. <laughs> I want to read that email now. <laughs> I don't remember now. <laughs> uh, anyways. Well, that, was the only, that was the only interesting thing. The rest of it was normal. <laughs> uh, next on the news, I think a lot of people heard that Intel had a little security flaw. Um, the way that it wrote to memory could be, um, what's the word? Abuse, uh, not abuse, but whatever the. Exploited? Exploited, yes. Um, so operating systems and Intel alike were rushing to get patches out and all that stuff. So um, I think what it came down to was a very nearly impossible chance that someone could actually do it but maybe like on a local network I don't know there's a, there's a proof of concept out now for the JavaScript oh. exploit so is there? Oh, just okay. any yeah just any old random website you're on no. um, JavaScript okay. uh, I mean again it's just a proof of concept doesn't work on every chip blah 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 but yeah there's loads cool. of proof of concepts out now on github um, so patch your systems people as soon as your um, microcode and kernel updates come out um, it's pretty big um, either that or uh, burn your computer and get your 1989 386 <laughs> out because uh, pre-1990 computers are not affected so go for safety oh and uh, I think every Android phone, every iPhone, just everything's affected. So, um, yeah, and you know how well Android patches get distributed by handset makers and their networks. So, I think basically your Android phone's going to remain unpatched for quite a while. So, um, don't go to any dodgy uh, porn sites on your phone. As far as <laughs> the because if they have JavaScript, you'll be. Uh, You'll be mining Bitcoin and shipping your bank details over. Oh, great. <laughs> you know, like a year ago, I saw that people were all pissed at the Pirate Bay because when you're on the Pirate Bay, they use JavaScript to mine Bitcoin off of your computer resources. And I saw it pop up again today, like there's a whole new wave of people are just pissed. and That is so unacceptable. But it's like, well, okay, you're downloading shit you're supposed to be paying for for free. So uh, I don't really know what the the argument is now that someone is using yeah. something of yours for free. Well, I think, Actually, it's, it, I think it's the pirate bay. It's like the perfect punishment for the people that are pirating. It's like <laughs> you're taking someone else's thing for free and the pirate bay is taking your yeah. thing for free. Yeah. It's, like, it's like the circle of life. But I think if you just were like on CNN... And they were, and they were ripping your CPU to 100%, as well as showing you all the ads, as well as, I think that would be taking the mic a little bit. I don't think it's something that any reputable publisher should do. The um, the the blog post of the week on Authority Hacker this week was actually about that using JavaScript crypto miners to monetize your website. So I think it's actually a little I, bit more common than you might think. Than just like I was just gonna say, is that is it. 
there's really no legal ramification, is there? No. I no. mean, it, you're just... Everything's still... Yeah. I think you would have to disclose it in your... Ethical? Uh, I don't know. Use. Yeah, I don't, I don't... And I, I think, think you'd so... have to disclose it in your terms of use that you were running... Because you're well, you're supposed to say everything. Like you're supposed to put on there, like you well, know, yeah, you know, it's not like you just have some shitty program software where, it, because it's a piece of shit, it uses all your resources. Now it's like I'm intentionally using more than what you whatever would have guessed. You know, it's. I think though it's going to slow uh, people's browsing down so much that people will lose more money than they make. I think it's going to be. Uh, I think this idea is stillborn. I think yeah. it's a complete stupid idea. I didn't get through their whole blog post, but they usually like tear shit apart completely. Yeah. So uh, you gotta take a look. I, I posted it in the chat if you want to read. Cool. Nice. Um, next on the list was uh, Rand. Uh, we always rip on Rand, but he had an interesting little point here. It's twice now we've been nice to him yeah. on the show, actually. So I feel like um, he's becoming a favorite. There is a website <laughs> that if you go on from a desktop won't let you look at it because it's iOS and Android only. Mobile only. Yeah, it doesn't even let you on on Windows Phone. <laughs> oh, no, not even it's not even yeah. mobile only. It's just I got hey. my old I got my old phone out to see. <laughs> I, I, I get his point here, but in the context of the actual website, I don't really think it's a big deal. This is obviously just a mini website marketing ploy. Winter I'm assuming if it's on the web, it's just written in JavaScript. So, like, it's going to run fine on your browser anyway. So, they're blocking people unnecessarily. I think he's mocking it for the right reasons. But, yeah, I was going to say it's like, stupid. even if it's, I didn't even look, but like Vince said, if it's just for that one reason, those reasons, why not just let it be open to the desktop, anyways? And if it doesn't look the yeah. same, you're not marketing to it, anyways. But, People like me, I hate looking at shit on my phone. So even if I'm on my phone, I'm really stupid and will like type it in in my browser. And I mean, may maybe the the webmaster is thinking that he's going to get an indirect ranking benefit from you know the time on site from, from mobile compared to desktop. Oh. But uh, I don't. It, it's it's nitpicky at best. So that's interest interesting. Do you think? Let's say he is trying to do something like that. I don't think... Do you think Google is sophisticated to look at it and be like, this site, this site should absolutely not rank on desktop for anybody? Well, I mean, I think if you're Google, you should just take a, this kind of site out of the index completely because the people that run it are clearly morons and therefore <laughs> you shouldn't send your users to them. So... I would uh, I would remove this site from the index if I was a search engine because they're clearly idiots. Jared said um, he was trying on an iOS agent and he still couldn't see it because it asked him to rotate his device. So it must be like <laughs> extremely interactive. Wow! Yeah. So they're like, they're like hardcore coding into like. So so why do they even have a website? Why not make it? Yeah, app? like this this is the, I mean this is an application where you write like a React Native app and just like. Or like just write it straight native and don't release it on the on the web at all. Actually, I, think I, I I didn't even get to like figure out the the purpose of the website because it took me like it was I was following like a snowflake for like thirty seconds and I was like <laughs> screw this and I like closed out of the website. So I don't. Even I can actually see website. an interesting point. Um, so Craig Road that's going to be talking about the the beacons. Um, apparently. You can take these beacons and you program a website onto them and you touch someone's phone, even if they don't know it, and it will load the website. Um, by default, every phone has this ability turned on for some reason. This might seem far-fetched and really out there, but what if like, you started building websites like this to get um, interaction with them and you just kind of walk around like a bar or whatever? And all of a sudden, these people go home, and they're drunk, and they're like, oh, what the fuck is this? Or something like, I don't know, this is probably way out there. but I, know, I need yeah. more information on these beacons and how to turn them off, please. Can you, uh, yeah, um, Craig will be talking about it. Story, uh, yeah, because I couldn't uh, believe it either. He's just like, here, swipe it. 
and he was doing a live thing uh, either last night or the night before, and I asked him, I'm like, so is this like enabled by default? Because I can't imagine this being like a really high conversion rate thing where you have to make sure people's phones actually have this turned on. And he's like, nope, it's uh, by default. And, and I'm like, so what the fuck? You can just walk to anybody walking down the street and be like, boom, you're uh, getting a little pop-up. I want my Windows phone back. It didn't support anything. <laughs> Definitely wouldn't have supported this. You could just about use the web. I mean, come on. Yeah. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna polish that bad boy off and keep it charged. I think just in case I get beaten. <laughs> I just got an Android today. I've been telling these guys that uh, of my troubles switching from Apple to Android. I'm well, glad uh, you finally. I'm glad you finally made the move. We've yeah, just got, so, Garrett, we've just got Garrett to fix now, and then we're all clean. So far, it's awesome, man. Um, I really do like it. My next phone will. It is be a better. Apple. It is a better operating system. I mean, the new Android they've made because I hadn't used Android for years and years and years, and compared with what it was like four years ago, five years ago, it's even you know it's just fantastic the improvements they've made. It's so much easier to use now. Yeah. It looks so similar, so you don't feel like, oh shit, this is some weird new thing. But everything you try and do just works together properly the way you'd expect instead of agonizing like it did on the early versions. So I'm really pleased with the new Android. Um, yeah, so it's, re it's, it's really intuitive the way it works. Uh, the only thing that worries me is it seems like every single app is like grabbing my location, grabbing mm -hmm. other data, sending data to a third you party. Can, you can turn lots of. Um, yeah, that's one thing they've added to the new Android is you've got granular control, so you can do. I mean, it'll let you do stupid things like turn off location data for Uber, and then you can't yeah. use Uber. But you, you can you can turn up you can turn off things like Gmail will let you turn off um, location data. Like they'll let you do it for their own apps things that they don't that it doesn't really need that it would have by default. You can. Yeah, I don't so know. I go to, uh, I'm sure there's a website out there that, that gives you kind of a roadmap of things to turn off. So I'm gonna try to figure that out tomorrow. Does yeah, it's pretty, pretty um, granular. Apple Pay and Google and Android has a variant, right? Or Google or yeah, Play Store. Um, so you got Apple Pay, like you know, you can go to the grocery store and swipe your phone, and then Android has the same thing. Yeah, they've just merged um, the two. They used to be separate. They used to have like um, I can't remember what they called the two of them now, but they're just going to have one Google Pay brand now. They've merged their two payment things together. Just I saw that in the news like a few days ago. I think it might have been on Zero Hedge or something. But yeah, they now have just one payment thing. I I haven't used, I've never used it, Apple Pay. No. But um, do you think Apple and the respective Android people, whoever, sell that data in more detail than say like a credit card company where you know they're selling without a name, without a, a identifying individual? This person spends about this much on dog food, blah, blah, blah. Do you think Apple has that hidden away in their Apple Pay terms where... Yeah, they have all that data for sure. I mean... Oh, I mean, they know, I know they I have it, the and it's much more detailed than any other credit card company even. But do you, do, you, do you think they sell it? I don't know. I, I guess for them, it, they, they would... They would for Apple specifically, off. because... Well, that's what I mean. They would have their terms of their service are yeah. so ridiculous as it is compared to everybody else. Like it wouldn't surprise me. I don't know why I just thought of it, but they spent this much, not not that um, just this amount of money in this area, but uh, I guess with the phone you could make it so much more. Yeah, I mean, well, Facebook already has the uh, Mastercard data, right? Uh, so I mean, I would be surprised if they don't just participate normally in the financial system which involves providing aggregated data about could we do something where like a grocery store you call get a ton of data just by tracking people's iPhones throughout the store in like locations where you should put shit on sale or like doing that in a casino or something like that do you think that's a very Amazon's testing it are they really yeah, with real stores, different like Prime members get a different price, and they change the pricing depending on. Uh, I saw, I saw that on this. I didn't dig into it, but they have like, uh, you know, like how Apple has Siri. I guess this is Bixby or Bigsby or something like that. But uh, 
it looks like there's a feature that if you turn it on, it's like a shopping feature, and you could just go around pointing your your, your camera at um, at the products in, in the aisle, and it'll pick up you know all all the cereal boxes in the aisle. And it'll pop up, and it'll sh it'll show you where you can get that for cheapest, or you can it'll find coupons that you can use right there. So it's um, I know there's apps out there like like Honey, I think is one of the apps, but this one seems like it does it in real time and is native to uh, the Android OS. So I thought that was pretty cool too. Yeah, I think that kind of um, that kind of stuff is going to um, eventually eliminate static coupons. There's not going to be any use tv971 to get 10 percent off coupons because right. the coupon sites are already eroding the value of that like um yeah if you put if you put a coupon box on your website and i know you you guys do this too like if you see a coupon box the first thing you do is oh yeah search for it brand yeah. name plus coupon yeah. grab your because you yeah. know the coupon box is there so then they they try hiding the coupon box or making people click a button to find it and stuff like that but the it's already eroding, and I think if there's once everyone once it makes the smartphone step and everyone's just automatically coupon checking, you're not getting the benefit of the coupon for your specific campaigns anymore. And I think people are going to move to personalized coupons only. So you'll have, and I know some small, really really small retailers doing this already. Because I know um, company that builds a lot of the apps for them. Um, you, to get any coupons at all, you have to have the app for that, that particular store. And we're talking about small regional shops in the UK. And mm -hmm. all their coupons now are personalized just to you on your phone in your name when you, when you shop. And I think that kind of phone-based personalized coupon is going to be going to be huge. Um, if you need one of those building, check out Justice Roche. Um, really cool boutique development agency over here in the UK. Um, oh, really cool. experienced in that kind of stuff. Um, not affiliated with us, and they don't pay me to say that, in case any of you are wondering about uh, demonetizing us. <laughs> I don't even know who they are. So. <laughs> yeah, Garrett doesn't know who they are. Um, but yeah, no, they, they do some really cool stuff around that. Um, but I think that's the future. Um, you're going to just get your coupons all bundled. Um, I think there's, there's an opportunity for an aggregator, um, some kind of app that allows stores to distribute personalized coupons without having to have an app for every store. Uh, and I think that's that will be the next phase because people will get fed up with having too many apps. Um, like we've seen with travel, like everyone, either you're either loyal and you book with the Hilton every time or Marriott Rewards every time or whatever, or you use Booking.com or other travel sites to exist, blah, blah. Right, but right. you don't, the kind of individual, you know, no one's going to seriously like have accounts with every single hotel chain. Well, some people are because they're <laughs> obsessive. And, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Obsessive, obsessive people like Garrett will have uh, the other, most people, I think, you know, 70% plus uh, are going to either choose one of the two strategies. They're going to use an aggregator or be loyal to one to maximize benefits. Yeah. Um, um, interestingly enough, on, on that site that I'm making for myself, GarrettOnLife.com, um, I decided I think the first like hobby series I'm going to do is, does it pay to be loyal to a brand anymore? And I'm going to compare it against, I'm loyal to Delta for the last few years. Did it cost me more than I've ever earned? Is it worth it in the future to switch? Should I be loyal to Hilton for this and this, or should I just be, like Steve said, booking.com, kayak.com, the cheapest first-class flight every single time? Should I be the cheapest hotel at the same quality at level? I can, I, that, can, I make a predict, can I make a prediction beforehand? And then I, I think I know what you're going to say. I think on flights, you're going to find that it doesn't pay to be loyal. I think... You're going to find that there's a kind of, on some airlines, there's going to be a tier that once you reach it, there's no point getting their diamond because you're already getting some benefits and you're getting some yeah. the extra points. Um, but when you've got a you know a JetBlue Mint Suite available with a lie down bed for three hundred dollars cheaper than right. American Airlines First Class for a, an old plane with an uncomfortable seat, and you're fly, you're paying that extra money to get points that are barely worth a hundred bucks. And then you don't get upgraded as much anymore. You don't get any special treatment anywhere. The lounges are all being downgraded. Or on American Domestic, they still charge you to get in. I think on flights, you're not going to find it. Hotels, so far, I'm really impressed with Hilton. 
and their loyalty program, the health and special rates, the um, the double points promotions, the free breakfast and stuff they keep throwing in every time I stay there because I'm yeah. an honors member. And so far, I'm super impressed with Hilton, and I've only just switched to them from the previous Scattergun. So that'll be interesting. So I think on hotels, I think despite the fact the program looks like it has no value, the difference in the way they treat you does seem to make a difference when you're actually staying there. Yeah. On the airlines, I think they're becoming so budgety, um, trying to you save know, costs. The flying first pressure. class, you know, I, I've sat next to people that are diamond medallions on Delta, right? And I've, I've never once heard a flight attendant say, Mr. Such and Such, we really appreciate you you know, spending probably half your year on our planes, you know, and they don't get treated any different than I do. And it's, it's something I would expect if I was in that guy's seat, like I've spent a lot of time, I've spent a lot of money here with you. They should be saying before anybody else, what can I do so that you're above everybody? And, but you know, it's... BA still do that. Um, do they? Even, even at Silver. Um, you get treated better than even at silver in business class, not even gold. I mean, it's not as good as when you're gold. Gold, it's like guaranteed. Silver, it's like if there's not too many golds. And there's, well, yeah. There's yeah. Not, yeah but, uh, which is fair enough. I mean, yeah, it is fair yeah, enough. And then um, at least they're still making an effort. Like, I think companies should. Um, but. Anyways, I guess we should not derail so hard. I'll that's uh, that's my prediction anyway. Yeah. I think yeah. flights you'll end up not being loyal to Delta anymore, and especially because some of the Sun Country fares from uh, Sun yeah. County or whatever they're called, they're really cheap. And yeah. uh, like I told you a couple of years ago, that guy I met in uh, Vegas at the airport, we were chatting business yeah. and stuff, and I asked him what flight he was on. He's like, "Oh, I always fly Sun Sun County first or whatever." And he was paying like three hundred dollars less than you yeah. for the same flight. Yeah, well, that's like, that's wow. what I I looked and I was yeah about that a lot cheaper. And it's like, yeah, the planes are a little older. They don't have a TV in the headset, but they still give you a TV or whatever. And I American usually Airlines, American Airlines flies you transcontinental without a TV on half of their fleet. Oh airlines. wow! Okay, well, <laughs> so yeah, so they're on par with a major carrier, anyways. So unless you get their premium product, they fly a couple of routes American with beds now on their real first, but it's like double the price so you're not comparing like for like on the on the like for like product american doesn't have tvs i'm, I'm gonna have to start being a uh, a flyer point nazi like you guys are now if we're yeah. gonna do all these conferences this, this year yeah you know in the okay. past i was only traveling like once or twice a year so it didn't even matter but yeah, well, yeah, it, yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't matter to you now you've, you've got jet blue flying out of your home airport like the yeah the new mint suite. It's like yeah. Another it's predicament I'm in. Six hundred bucks with a bed. I mean, that, that that's what I bought to go to Vegas, and then obviously I lost that ticket because of the hospital situation. But uh, well, I'm definitely gonna gonna try that out next time. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm flying down uh, in March. Um, I'm actually flying from Philadelphia to Boston on purpose just to because uh, that was well, it was three hundred dollars cheaper. And I get the better <laughs> flight, and all I have to do is hop to Boston. So, what, like, what, what, what conference is in March again? That's Leeds, 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 Leeds Where, where is it? Vegas. Las Vegas. Oh, that's, I'm going to go to that one with you. Uh, okay. Because right. so, Pop, Pop, PopCon is only one day. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. I, I think if you, PopCon Las Vegas is the one to go to in November if you go to PopCon. Yeah, I was just going to go because for a while I had a, I had a wild hair up my ass. Like, I'm going to make Delta Diamond Medallion. 2018 <laughs> and so i'm just like picking out conferences and planning shit and then like really it looking at it almost seems like casino cards like oh, i'm gonna make platinum status <laughs> at you know theaters. like i've never had status at a single fucking casino and uh <laughs> you've got to read um there's an old lady i met on the plane actually from vegas she wrote one of the best-selling books about um the point scheme obviously the ones to hit are downtown and the locals ones so she did things like the Four Queens, the Station Casinos, and she had status at them all. But basically, she got her stays free every time, and usually like three, four hundred dollars to spend in the restaurants and stuff and shops. So, yeah, you know, obviously she's gone. I need to be more day, demanding at the Four Queens. Yeah. I know. Yeah, you were a pretty loyal player. I mean, literally, you would you'd be there like whenever we weren't in meetings. I mean, like yeah. lifetime. Lifetime, I am up slightly, so I mean, I, you, you can't expect them to give me a lot. Well, I guess they should, because they should be trying to get me to lose it. 
they should be trying to get me to lose it very hard. But the most they've ever really offered me is two nights in their standard room. And it's like, well, if you they want upgraded me to, you, They upgraded you to a suite one. Well, that's because they were full. So oh. I checked in after you. <laughs> but the, even then, like, the suite, like, I mean, yeah, it was cool to have a suite, but it was a suite from the 1970s that hadn't been redone. And it was, it was a little, uh... My, my, my buddy, my buddy is, uh, is a seven stars, seven stars member with total rewards. So, so how much does he lose? Well, he's, he's like a five-figure blackjack player at every visit. Oh. Um, so we get the limo from New York City all the way down to AC or, or the, or the plane <laughs> to Vegas. And then we get the, uh, you know, the, the four-room suite in, uh, any of the Caesars properties. Or any total rewards property. So that's Harrah's, uh, Caesars, Tropicana. Do you go to AC uh, often? Not not just to gamble, but uh, me and Lil John were thinking about going out there for a couple of days. Just uh, I hear there's still a lot of good restaurants. I know the the city itself is like turning into a Detroit, but um, the city. I mean, you just want to stay on the strip at, uh, unless you're going to one of the one-off resorts like uh, Borgata or Rebel, which is I think is going to be hard rack now. But the strip, uh, the boardwalk is, is where you want to stay. The actual internal city is, is pretty, uh, pretty beat there's up. Some, there's some amazing food in the hellhole of the city, but you have to uh, yeah. depart quickly after your meal. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I saw. Yeah. You can get your Philly cheesesteaks and like the local. I get your, I you would say. Well, uh, I want to go for like seafood, and seafood, and be like, yeah, I'm in Atlantic City, just eating forty oysters, if I can, on the boardwalk or some shit. If, 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 you're, better, you're better, you're better off going to the uh, the proper Atlantic towns like um, Sea Isle City and all the spring break type towns. Uh, if you, yeah. If you want, uh, if you want good seafood and because like it's all it's the shitty casino shit, just like in Vegas. I took my I took my mom to um, a, a town called Cape May. And oh yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, um, our best client ever, Marty Overline, just bought a bought a house that he remodeled. Um, I'll have to hit him up then, Cape May. Like honestly, that's a good spot. Okay, I'll call Marty. It's, it's a good, it's a good family spot. Good family spot. It's like a beachy town for the family. Oh, and, uh, me, me and little John want to go. The, then let's go to Atlantic City. I'll meet. I'll meet you there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like uh, I've been to Atlantic City once for about two hours and lost three hundred bucks of blackjack at Harris and. I never went back. <laughs> well, that's we're we're way off track here. Let's, yeah. let's get back on track and we'll talk about this later. Anyways. This is, this is an important discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we covered a lot of ground here. Now you know. You wonder yeah, what now, goes now on. Now you know what SEO is. <laughs> so keep, 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 this is like one of those uh, keep going to school kids. Keep working on your, keep working on your websites, guys. And, uh, yeah. Come join us in AC. Oh, yeah, don't gamble. Um, <laughs> okay, don't gamble. I though. think that... <laughs> Um, did we talk about the deep learning stuff? Or did I skip over that? We're up to hot pages. So we talked about the deep learning stuff. That's no. next. That's next after hot oh, pages. Oh, I missed it's the NBC oh. hot pages. All right, Steve, you can talk about this one. Yeah, so this one is, uh, we all remember Hub Pages from the uh, glory days of SEO. Uh, yeah. Well, it wasn't yeah. even glory days. It was the uh, the second wave of glory days, the Web 2.0, Parasite Page. Uh, what was the other one that was really famous back then? Squidoo. Squid Squid yeah. Yeah. All these, all these sites, and, you know, they all got, you know, the whole um, demand media thing kind of washed them all away at the same time. They were all tarred with the same brush, you know, these non-expert stuff, you know, how to brush your teeth is not an article that, I mean, the article deserves to exist, but not the way they were written, you know, like, get yeah, yeah, yeah. but you know, like a dentist explaining how to brush your teeth properly, totally valuable, get the toothbrush, <laughs> add toothpaste, you know, um, but they tried to reinvent themselves, they tried to, uh, you know, to have a turn to quality. You know, all the same things that Demand Media were um, doing publicly as well. And um, they just finally, they uh, found a buyer. So I think there was a lot of fondness and a lot of happiness on Twitter and around the social media community seeing uh, seeing these guys finally get their exit and get something else to do with their lives and uh, part of a bigger group yeah. uh, where they've got you a know, chance. You know, pages, pages was the best of those Parasite, you know, Web 2.0 platforms because they, they they did a, a lot of cool stuff that probably would have taken off it was if it wasn't abused so so badly by by us I mean like you could I think you could 
inject your own Google AdSense code onto your hub pages, um, you know, website. Uh, it was like modular. It was the beginning of the whole drag and drop visual composer uh, craze that we have now. So I, I remember it being really cool, and you know, some you know, if we just took the time to create a really good property on hub pages, I think that it's something that would have been a lot more popular, and it wouldn't have had the ups and downs that we saw. But uh, well, I think these Web 2.0 sites, the as well as you know, the 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 whole. Panda obviously is what wiped them out. Yeah, I think they were the first warning sign that the internet wasn't going to be the way it was before, and new social media or new communities weren't going to be easy to create anymore the way they were at one point. New properties, new ways of distributing content. The it was the start of the closed gated communities: Google, Facebook, and other, and you know, to a lesser extent, Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> controlling traffic sources for new sites. I mean, you look at sites now where it's like search from Google 30%, Facebook 30%, Instagram and others 20%. And, you know, you're only leaving 20% for other traffic sources. Um, back in the days of hub pages and stuff, you know, there was a lot of traffic just from all over the place. It was kind of the start of the closing up of the internet and businesses that one of the big players chose to pick on got wiped out. And I think it, it was kind of a warning sign of the danger of building a big business that's completely dependent. Like, you know, if um, if you had a really profitable, like say you did dog vitamins or something, and you had a really profitable landing page in search, and Google penalized you, you know, you don't really care. You just switch to Facebook ads and something else. You know, you just on to the next traffic source because you're running a small business you can pivot really easily but you build something huge like hub pages um, you know like 12 years it's saying on CNBC that's a long time to grind till you find your exit and actually get your money because um, they've all been working for below market salaries you know grinding along just waiting to get out it's a yeah. tough tough grind building something big if you're going to be dependent on any of the big platforms for your reach. So it, lo it looks like these guys made out though. They, uh, are you calling me right now? What is going on? Uh, <coughs> so the shareholders got 5 million and then the executive staff got something like 10 to 15 million based on um, performance over the next three years. So mm -hmm. Uh, I don't. I'm not into the whole uh, startup scene, but you know they raised eight million and they're exiting with up to fifteen million. Doesn't seem that bad to me. No, no, it was a good news story. I included yeah. it as some feel-good news. You know, like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, because we all remember Hub Pages. We all liked what they were doing. They got wiped out as part of something that wasn't really their fault. And it's kind of a little feel-good to see them all moving on to a better, better place now and getting into something new. It was uh, it was the it was my feel good story this week. It was meant to be good. Cool, <laughs> I just I just look really tired and grumpy today because of all the uh, getting the uh, twenty four hours of SEO stuff all launched today. Is just about finished me off. So <laughs> yeah, really good job on that, dude. Actually, yeah, I can't even right. do a, I can't even do a feel good story with a smile tonight. <laughs> <I'm so tired. laughs> cool. cool. So next on the list, um, neural networks. I enjoy talking about these and. What they are doing, excuse me, turning design mockups into the code with deep learning. Um, something I think is actually relatively amazing. Um, if a designer can, at, at, at obviously it's not perfect yet, but at the end of the day, a designer just uploads their PSD file, their Photoshop file, and the computer can actually, boom, 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 boom. It's all in HTML. And... Okay. That would be pretty slick. Um, I think it uses Bootstrap as well, and I think Twitter really don't get enough credit for the impact that them writing and open sourcing the Bootstrap framework had on the whole development community and what's going to be possible on the web. I mean, all these page builders, a lot of them use Bootstrap code, and this AI new tool is... You know, I, I know a few people same. that work in various industries that use neural nets, um, extremely resource-heavy neural nets and the reason they have their businesses is because 
they understand like what goes goes into a neural net. And like for people that don't know, it's basically like a if you're taking calculus, you have a, a matrix, and you're using an endless amount of matrix with an endless amount of logical possibilities, and the endless amount is how smart you are, and then how smart you can make. I guess that's kind of like an oxymoron, like how smart you can make the next matrix without you actually touching it. And there's been some turmoil about stuff getting released like this because a lot of machine learning stuff up until like the last year, people just don't talk about it. It's very privately privately held. You don't talk about it. What you're doing is on your own. And um, it's interesting to me to see someone's actually coming out in this detail and something that I think is actually really cool um, what they're doing, being able to take a design file. Yeah, um, I mean the article is a little bit ahead of me because I'm, uh, I'm doing a couple of machine learning courses but I'm on the very early stages and taking it pretty slow because it's kind of a lot of it's new to me but um, <laughs> some of the things you can learn, the open source libraries now and the things that you can just set up to start doing something or testing something without you know, you just have to understand the principles and the maths and the, and then you can just start analyzing documents for some particular pattern you're looking for and train the thing to to do it and stuff like that. There's, there's loads of um, really powerful stuff you can do from a really quick start. Um, and I, the reason I included this was not so much because I'm worried about, um, well, designers aren't going to be replaced by this. Designers are just going to have, instead of, you know... No, yeah, it's, it's not a designer replacement. It's no, more it's like a, a, it's a... It's a tool for designers. Yeah. Uh, but I, I included it because I was thinking about, we reviewed um, Nick Eubank's uh, um, in, inverse document frequency tool. Um, and I was thinking around... You know, there's, there's tools like that that just do the analysis. Um, how close are we to tools where you put a keyword in and it can it can generate you an outline for the perfect page based on everything that ranks for that term or like 100 related terms right. using this kind of machine learning? I Obviously, then you get into a machine learning war with Google because obviously they're going to want to avoid being manipulated by people that spot patterns. But I... They're already in that war just against a whole massive hive of uh, a billion humans trying to rank their websites. Um, it's just kind of interesting that I think that we're, this shows we're clearly closer to that than I thought we were. Yeah. Because um, it's impossible. Like, you, you look at, like, because Vince talks about this before, you know, his strategy is looking at, you know, what's ranking. You work out, you know, what does Google think this term's about? Like, is this a sales term? Is this an information term? Is this a mixed term where all different kinds of stuff are showing up? Then you work out what one you're going to attack to get there. Then you work out how you can be better than the existing pages. You work out what strategies they're doing, what... Yeah. What, what I, 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 I think that, it, it, as far as right now, a lot of it is... You can reverse engineer what's working now, but you still have to understand conceptually why it's working. And um, I think if somebody is able to work that into a software platform, then SEO is going to be com completely changed, and, and, and online marketing in general, because that then it just opens up the whole game to anybody that can pay for a software license or something like that. So I think we're a little further away from that because there is that human element. You, you, you do have to understand conceptually, you know, why something works. Beyond I, 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 I disagree. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I think um, we overestimate our uniqueness and power. Um, like I think developers would have said, the design bit's easy, you know, like, a, and there's already design tools that'll spew out like a hundred different variants for a website. And then you just tick a few modules and it puts together like a nice bootstrap site for you. Um, so, but they're what happened, not, what they're not very good, but they're not. What they're happens when 100% of SEOs can all create the perfectly optimized website and content? Well, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying there isn't going to be an edge to doing things differently. What I'm saying is that getting to where there's a tool that can do as well as most people doing that competitor analysis and understanding why things rank is closer than you think. 
Yeah. Like I think what well, because all you're describing is a load of grunt work and a little quick little bit of thinking. Like the actual intense in time where you're using a lot of your intelligence when you're doing one of those competitive analysis is probably the the five minutes at the end when you've done all the grunt work. So I think replacing all of that ninety five percent of grunt work with a really smart tool that gives you really smart insights. Yeah, that, that is going to that's going to be really close. I, I think yeah. that's we're going to see something. I mean, there's already some SEO tools. Um, I mean, we were sent a trial link for one. I guess either myself or Garrett will look at that for the next show. I forwarded it to him just today, so neither of us had a chance to have a look. But um, they're sponsoring Brighton SEO in April. It's some kind of mm-hmm. competitive analysis SEO tool. And, and again, it's not neural nets and at this level, but it's it's just an algorithm based one that they've 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 tuned up. But I think there's going to be more and more of those kind of products, and I think we're going to see a more competitive landscape because of it. Because, like you say, your your person who's starting out building a site is not going to put up that complete donkey page that they put up now because they don't know what they're doing. They're going to have a a tool tell them this is what you need to write about to compete with these people and this is what your competitors are doing in a lot more detail. Mm-hmm. I can see that in the next if there isn't one in three years I'll be really surprised. Well what's the name of that tool that, that you that uh, you guys uh, give me one second guys I will find it. I haven't had a proper look yet. Um just gonna talk about it next week but uh, let's see if I can find my email to Garrett. Yeah, I'm, I can't remember. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, where are we? I did have something to say, but then I forgot. So now I'm... Sorry, just send it to me later. I've, I've, I've archived it, but we're going to be talking about it on the show next week. I'll, so put, it in the, I'll put it in the description of the video later. Cool, yeah, cool. so you guys can check it out in advance and then we'll yeah. talk about it in a little bit more detail on the show. But it's not what we're talking about here in terms of the next level, but I think it's it's the first kind of, these kind of cool. starter tools are the first. I mean, because you tried onpage.org, didn't you, Garrett, a while ago? Yeah, that, that, they're called Write now. They, they rebranded, and uh, I wasn't I impressed I, with I, them. Yeah, uh, I don't even, if I did, I don't remember, so I can't imagine I was happy at all. It, okay. it, was, just, it was just one the majority of the tool is just that it scraped your website and it gave you all the on, on site metrics that you want to see. And the only cool part was that, uh, that term frequency tool. And they were really the first, first company to roll that out, uh, in a big way. But now a lot of people have it. So there's no, uh, reason to really use them. Um, cool. That's good. Good insight into that one then. Yeah, I think, Vin, you were saying, like, I think Vin has a good point. Um, so many SEOs can take this, and it's going to make us pretty much identical, where we're all in, like, that top quadrant of all of a sudden we went from 60% of SEOs are bad, and then you have, like, 40% are good, and then within that 40%, maybe actually only 10% of those people are good or yeah. something, you know. I think most of the people that are ahead of the curve in SEO already know and are kind of like 10 years, not even 10 years from now, three years from now, things are going to be so different. Or, you know, we all have our own personal assumptions where things have changed so much and it's like by the time that really cool neural net comes out to where we can do everything for SEO, it's all voice. And then now it's like, okay, there's no library for voice search. And that's going to be two years behind because no one has access to quantum computing or something. You know, I don't, I don't know. I guess it's just how I see it. I don't think it's going to be a, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I wasn't disagreeing with uh, Vin's point. No, that, y- yeah. That, I, no, no, no. I, 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 I understand his point. Is point. Is that. Yeah, I just forgot what I was going to say, so I, I didn't mean to make it like a, <laughs> no, an interject. Yeah. Steve was saying that um, as far as far as the data, everybody's going to have the same data, but it's going to really be up to how you use your noggin and how you use that data. Well, yeah, about. it's still like the yeah. same. Like, look at. You pay 150 bucks a month for Ahrefs or 
similarly comparing tool, you can figure out anything about any competitor, and we still have that skill gap, I guess, where yeah. everyone has cheap, cheap available tools, right. and you still see the top ten percent. Or yeah, um, yeah. For, for now, what we have to do is take that data and then kind of do uh, uh, the next step is create the outline for your content from that data. But that's kind of like what I'm going to be doing on the 24 hours of SEO, yeah, taking yeah. that data and then making an outline for a piece of content. Um, but I think the next step is, is um, these software providers will be able to make those outlines or be able to provide us more insight into the data, which will just allow us to kind of springboard to the next step because we're not going to have to spend all of our time doing that grunt work, like, like Steve said. But, um, but, yeah, it's exciting. I mean, yeah. at the I've been around long enough to know that um, I shouldn't be predicting anything and just take it as it comes, you know? Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. it's, it's usually nothing that we expect. No. That, that, that is true. Yeah. Anyways. Okay. So now we're on to the main topic, correct? Yeah. And this the uh, future of link building. I've, we're going to share an article. I've seen it floating around all week. It's interesting. It's going to be cool. Um, it's a good thing to talk about it. When I say cool, I don't necessarily mean I agree 100 percent with everything. I think it's a really well, good. Well, the guy, thing. the guy, the guy's called Viper Chill. How can he yeah. not be cool? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never, I never really oh, bit on the Viper Chill to as as a blog, as as a guru, or or a good source of information. But a, a lot of people sing his praises. Were you guys ever fans or? I was I like, never a fan. I like, to, I, mean, I like to keep up with him, see what he's doing, yeah. but I don't. I, I, just, I don't. I don't agree with everything he does, but sometimes there's but, stuff but, I agree with, and that makes his sense. Deal now? He only puts out like an article once or twice a year at this point, or Steve. Yeah, ahead. he mostly publishes long form pieces now. He used to be more prolific with random thoughts. Now it's. Um, I mean, the point of this Gap site, for those of you who don't know from when it launched, was to identify um, gaps and opportunities in the market. So if you look at some of the other posts, they're a lot more general. It's not all SEO stuff. It's, I mean, it's all marketing stuff, and it's mostly online stuff. Um, but it's, you know, gaps in the market that he's identified or thinks are interesting. Um, so if you take this article within that context, it makes a lot more sense. He's kind of... Um, obviously has an agenda. He's anti people no following links um, because he rightly points out that if you have so little control over your writing staff and have so little control over your editorial... How can you have any credibility? That, yeah. Well, 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 let, 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 let's back up and explain the article first. I mean... Yeah, go on, go on, Vin. You, you do the rundown and then we'll... So the, so the article basically is pointing out that uh, there's, a, there's a link building tactic that's being used where uh, a random website will create a review or a feature or an interview uh, about a topic or a company that's completely unrelated to the, to the topic of the publishing site. Not, um, not necessarily unrelated. It, 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 sometimes they're pretty related as well. So Okay, related or could be a completely un unrelated. Yeah, and mix the strategy. They, and, they're, and they're writing these articles and publishing them solely to get picked up by um, the company that's being written about in their media section or in the press section on their website to get a, a link. Um, but the controversial part about this is the publishing site is no following their link to the uh, featured company website and the featured company is giving them a do follow link back to their site and as such they're getting uh the ranking benefit because of it so it's a little it is very black hat um but then viper chill goes on to kind of get a little political about it and saying that anybody anybody that no follows all of their links uh should not get the benefit of any do follow links that are pointing to their site um, so I guess that's the gist of it, right, Steve? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's all about targeting brands that have press pages or mention people that cover them, and you just fake covering them. Um, I mean, it's really interesting how this is just old stuff. I mean, back on the uh, 
Paladis website, our old uh, agency, we wrote about how we did exactly this in the um, poker business. Mm. Um, we, we interviewed uh, her on our YouTube show, where they're not getting a link back or anything, and we had like no traffic, um, famous poker players, and then they linked to our affiliate site. Um, it's exactly the strategy. Um, you know, and, I, and it's in the uh, the Builder Society. I, I don't give away all the secrets in this kind of detail in my uh, Builder Society Crash Course Guide because it's uh, aimed at people who are prepared to think deeply. But I do uh, I do have this in here where I'm talking about um, deliberately quoting famous people in your blog posts and then letting them know so that they link to you in their press section and stuff. So this strategy is in the uh, Builder Society Crash Course. I haven't been... Uh, I haven't been holding back these uh, these secret strategies from you guys. It's uh, it's all in there, and I guarantee you for the uh, oh, I mean that, 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 all, all these all these big reveals that come. If you read my free guide on Builder Society, <laughs> chapter twenty on the crash course, outreach better than most professionals. All the stuff you read in these kind of crazy articles revealing new things that no one knows about. It's it's all in there for you already. I haven't kept anything secret. That, that was kind of just general ego bait. Though this is very specific to those gigantic corporations that have the you know in the news or media sections, and basically they just scour the internet to find any mention about their company and then drop a link to it because it's good PR for them. Um, and th there's SEOs that are just purely abusing that you know that knowledge. So. I think that it's not necessarily a black hat tactic if it's niche specific stuff, you know. So if, if you're a keyword research tool, or if you're an SEO company and you're doing a review on Ahrefs, and if they had an in the media section and you get a link back from that, that doesn't really seem off base to me. But if you're an SEO company and you're doing a feature on Captain Crunch cereal and you get a link back. That's kind of shitty. Um, so yeah, I mean, but, but I mean, that's what uh, you know. That's what I'm talking about in the guide when I'm talking about thinking deeply about how you can do things better than just the obvious things. So you're like saying, oh yeah, but you just mentioned basic ego baiting in your uh, article. That's because I didn't want to give away the uh, <laughs> the full strategy. But if you think deeply about, well, who you know, can I ego bait big companies? Of course you can, because there's people yeah. there. It's the same. It's the same. I mean, it's just the same strategy. We, you know, we had um, one of the authors of one of the the biggest selling poker books of all time appear on the show and promoters in his forum. Um, you know, it, it's just straightforward. I mean, it. You could figure this stuff out from all the stuff uh, Carter shares as well with the uh, traffic leaking stuff because a lot yeah. of it's is more akin to that kind of um, hacky um, immediate results kind of marketing because you're. You're hitting someone up, you're manipulating them, you're tricking them into leaking traffic your way for very little it's, in return. It's social it's really engineering good, uh, at, at, at a very basic level. But I, what Viper Chill does here is he kind of tries to back Google into a corner because uh, with the nofollow stuff. Because what Google did is when all the editorial links were getting way too popular, they kind of <laughs> they kind of forced those big. Uh, editorial platforms like uh, Huffington Post and Forbes, they kind of force them to no follow all of their links. So he, what he's saying in, in a roundabout way is, if if you're not going to provide any link benefit to the sites that you're saying are good, uh, that you're vouching for, but you're going to no follow your link to right. them, then as a platform, you shouldn't have a, any SEO benefit from any of the links. Kind of yeah, and I, I, think, I actually agree with him 100%. I, yep, so do I. I it's like uh, the whole point of you having a website, like like let's say you're selling pool tables and um, rewind even 20 years ago, you have a website, you're selling pool tables and you link out, like there's a finite amount of people actually using the internet and you're risky enough to put an outgoing link to a pool table authority that explains how to clean the table. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, that's worth a lot of money and it's worth a lot of credibility. It's worth a lot because you're saying I'm vouching for this website. And yes, I know people hearing this are going to say, well, I run like a thousand links to my site 
through PBNs. Well, that's the whole reason Google doesn't like it because if I have a legit business and I don't, I know nothing about SEO, and I link out to another pool table company, I must have one hell of a good fucking reason to do it. Right. If I'm linking, well, what, what, what what he's doing is basically calling Google out yeah. on their favoritism, because what they're basically doing is they're allowing Forbes and Huffington Post to no fault all other links, but still rank at yeah. the top of the search engine. And they shouldn't. And 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 for why? For, for yeah. what reason? Because obviously they're they, not credible. I mean, I mean, it's actually it's actually good for us because. Um, we, you know, we do PR pitches to the the next tier down of publishers, and their links are all still followed and all still count. Um, and previously, where all of the big press companies had followed links, it was people that could afford the fifteen hundred dollars a placement on Forbes that people sell them for, who were getting the more powerful links. And it was people that were doing crazy ass real PR and getting the New York Times links that were beating our clients. Now all the links that those people that are spending more or who are getting real press coverage are getting, they're all no-followed bullshit or there's no link at all. So it's actually taken out a, a tier of competition to you now. If you're able to pitch the next tier of site down, those good quality authority sites in your, in your niche that aren't Forbes, um, <laughs> You can still get really good followed links. See, but your, I, I, your competitors I, I think... used to be able to get better links than you because they could get Forbes if they paid fifteen hundred dollars. They could get big newspapers if they pitched them. They can't get them anymore because they're all no followed. Hey, don't, don't forget, I, I was supposed to be in Forbes amazing. twice, but uh, Outreach Mama was a liar. Yeah, Our Outreach Mama's yeah. promised Garrett two interviews with their. Forbes yeah, I'll call you out publicly. Like, what the fuck? Like you know, I'm a link. Uh, you know, I sell you're links. Talking about giving giving away too much information, Steve. I think that you just gave away a whole lot of information that, that you probably shouldn't have. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. But but what, I, what I think is really I don't think I, I don't think I gave away much information at all. It's the problem is, um, <laughs> I think it's not, we it's give not a lot of... to many people. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But it's what I think is really it's still not obvious to some people. But... Yeah. What is really interesting about what he's doing here is he's basically, I mean, think about it. If if Google was to um, allow those big publishers to go back to do follow links, then we're going back to the editorial shit and, and that craze, so they can't do that. But uh, on the other hand, they're playing favorites right now. So well, I, don't, I, don't, I, I think... To say they're playing favorites isn't the correct. If you read like a little bit more um, towards the end, when he's talking and a little bit more, um, he kind of goes on a bit of a. It's not a hundred percent coherent, but he. Uh, yeah, it, it gets squirrely at the end. Yeah, he kind of gets a little bit angry, I think, which is understandable. But one of his main points isn't that Google's deliberately playing favoritism. It's because they're now following their links, but people are still linking to Forbes and stuff like that. Forbes are getting benefit automatically because they're already a big site and that makes it automatically more difficult. So it's not that Google has deliberately said, right, we're going to play favorite and we're going to rank them really well, even so, if they've got less links. So what, what, what just happens? Saying, they're just saying they're just going to get more links, which is Google's main ranking signal because they're Forbes or whatever. Um, and we're not picking on Forbes particularly. We know you're one of many, many, many yeah. sites that know follows your links now. It's just because that was the example. That well, what up. happens when um, a site or multiple sites of, of that size, and if, if Google goes ahead and says and says uh, what he's suggesting here and doesn't give them any SEO benefit anymore and do follow links that are pointing to Forbes, obviously their sites are going to crash. Right, so then what happens to the Google search engine and the internet in general when like the biggest publishers well, what out there? What happens to the Google search engine if everyone no follows all of their links? Because the link graph is how they determine the authority of sites. Do you think um, there's some sort of weird stuff in the algorithm where it um, there's a heavy emphasis on quote unquote trusted publishers, regardless of where they're sending their own links? But what if in this algorithm? Something that is normally weighted very heavy, like Forbes, is that's what I'm saying. Destroyed, then, yeah. yeah. What what happens when that's just destroyed? Do you think that sends it into like some sort of chaotic fucking oblivion? And that that's what his underlying point is. Yeah. Because and and he's saying in a roundabout way to, to not outright say it, 
because he wants Google to come out and address the issue. I wouldn't but, be surprised. You know, like some of the ranking updates that we've seen, you know, ranking updates <laughs> that we kind of assume Google's done something. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, and I'd love if someone who's a real data kind of um, guy would have a look at the dates that some of these big publishers know followed all their links. Um, the, it's you know, like, like a, tri a trickle-down effect. The, the, Moz, the, Moz, the Moz volatility on those days, the uh, Mozcast. Uh, and the search metrics data from those days and stuff like that. I would be really surprised if some of the big publishers know following all their links. My dog is trying to get it. <laughs> my puppy is walking around too. <laughs> Garrett's got his under control. Doesn't disturb the show. Um, <laughs> we, uh, I'd be surprised if some of the, you know, a site the size of Forbes, a site the size of the other big ones that have done it, having composed. If they suddenly know follow all their links, there's a lot of businesses that have got big authority links from those. I'd be surprised if that doesn't cause a noticeable disruption in the search rankings. So I'd love to see someone who's um, really into the data have a look at that and let me know. Yeah. I, I, just generally, just uh, it would be interesting to learn how powerful or how much of a weight those giant publishers have on the rest of the, of the I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Dr. Pete because he. Uh, he seems pretty chill. Yeah. He, he replies yeah. to my tweets and stuff sometimes. He seems pretty chill guy. I'm going to ask him if, if they have any data because I, I would just be amazed if um, some of those big, big sites no following all their links didn't correlate with some pretty legit sites losing. So you have to. So I, I'm, I started making like a silent assumption that um, Blumenthal is actually going to talk about this slightly in probably not a direct way, but the branding that is going on in Google where we're living all of a sudden in a time of fake news regardless of what your opinion on it is there's a lot of shit going on and I think it's becoming well, more news itself. well I think I think we can all say um, a lot of stuff a lot of the news we read like I read the Wall Street Journal how much of that shit is actually paid to be there Right. How much stuff is actually, in Google sense, not necessarily paid to be there, but they allow it because it's a huge conglomerate that needs to be there, and that's what people want to see in their mind. Do you think in the next couple of years you might see a push where shit gets really shaken up because all of a sudden, whether it's a just like a natural thing that we see going on in the world, that we're sick of seeing this shit, that because the internet, we're more educated than ever, we can tell that this this article is paid for, and it's in the newspaper. Or well, I, would, I would argue that the internet's caused people to become dumber than ever. And <laughs> yeah, it, I can make anything. the same argument. I just, it just came up in my head. Do you think people are actually going to start saying, even though we know, I think just about everybody knows that we're reading what we want to read because it's on our phone and we don't really care because it aligns with our thoughts and yeah well i mean i, I, I think i think i, I, think I, I think deliberately read uh, dissenting opinions like i i'm I, I hate to say I'm a conservative on a show that's mostly watched by Americans because as a voter for the conservative party in the UK, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a raving lunatic communist as far as uh, <laughs> yeah. American politics is concerned because yeah. our conservative party supports yeah. the... Uh, as NHS. far as I know, you're still on the second, third son or something from the... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. So, <laughs> so yeah, we're, we're raving communists over here as far as the American political spectrum. But I do lean probably economically conservative anyway. That's probably a fair assessment, even in yeah. your system. Um, but, I, you know, I deliberately read The Guardian, which is the socialist broadsheet over here, just because it's interesting to see a dissenting opinion. And But I think, like Garrett said, if your news source is now Facebook, where it's a filtered uh, feed... You're never. You're not reading those dissenting opinions. You have to deliberately go out and seek them out. And the percentage of us who do are in the minority. So Garrett's a hundred percent right there about the filter bubble. It, it's not necessarily that it's fake news. It's just another editorial. Editorials were never meant to be news. There's some some true. person's opinion at the newspaper. Yeah, true. You're just reading more and more editorials 
from people that have more and more. Yeah, so on that point, do you think we have a huge disconnect between what news actually is and we've translated it so poorly into like the SEO community where this shit is going to be popular? It's people are going to read this stuff, it's going to go to high traffic sites, but in reality, we've poorly as a community of the million people in SEO have translated it into such a piece of shit thinly veiled link attempt or something or uh, something like that you know it, it's gotten to the point where people are starting not to know the difference between news and this was a paid link or actually an outreach link that was done very well or something you know well, if it's done really well, what does it matter? If it's if well, if I if I did a a forced news injection very well, it wasn't really news. It's like I had to make a news operator aware of what's going on. Like I don't know, I, but then I guess well, there's been cases, but there is a there are a couple of troll accounts on Twitter, like comedians run them, and they've managed to bait the news into writing about things that aren't true a few times. Journalists don't have the time to fact check things anymore. I think you got to read the book. Uh, Trust me, I'm lying. Did you read that? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's I all about that shit. Yeah, I'd, but it's 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 easier now because back then the editors fact check things, sources. Yeah, had to be yeah, we talked on. Yeah, I mean, the, like there was a there was a story today about something President Trump had said. It wasn't even quoting an original source. A friend of a friend of someone who was there said that he said something about this that and that made that made the news that actually got printed in a, in a mainstream news outlet over there that's not a news story that's that's random hearsay like if you even had an original source someone at the meeting told us the president said x 100 percent okay to print it if the person's lying well you know you what are you supposed to do you you, you can't spy on the meeting you can only take people who are there's word for it, and yeah. report it but a friend of the person who was there said that someone he spoke to heard what that's, that's absolutely that that's not news i mean but it's news now yeah that's, i mean i think the 24 hour news cycle's probably got more to blame for it than seos and the internet to be honest well, though, yeah I mean. i'm not saying my point's right I, it just hit me like do we contribute it to it I, I i think we do contribute it slightly um Oh, oh yeah, yeah. As a whole, as a whole, um, it's it's not everybody, and I I mean I guess I need to think about it more personally. But as a whole, you know, well, actually, it's, it's 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 profit over quality, man. I yeah. mean, uh, you know, how, you know how many articles or how many pieces of content does Forbes publish every day, and how, out of how many of those is is actually a profitable piece of content. So, you know, that, that one or two pieces well, of Well, I mean, how many times do you start reading a piece on Forbes, get about two paragraphs in and close it? I mean, that's the difference. Uh, every time, because I was yeah. putting out well, a lot that's of my, articles. That's my point, that, you know, the one or two articles a day that hit and actually make them money have to pay for, you know, the 20 other articles that, that bombed because it's shit content. So I, I don't think that... Um, those big publishers are so much worried about being correct or, or being newsworthy as they are, you know, throwing shit against the wall and hoping that. Well, it's because of the uh, the embarrassment's gone. Like back in the broadsheet days, if you had to publish a retraction, it was on your front page, and it wasn't like you know your headline, but it was on your front page. We made a mistake in this story. We apologize. Here's yeah. the correct information, and that was quite embarrassing if you were the Financial Times or the the, the Times of London or something. Now you publish a, a post buried amongst a thousand other posts you yeah. published. I mean, how, how, how many times this year alone has CNN had to retract their, their huge, you know, you know, oh, news I stories? Mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. They didn't get me started on CNN. They're so, <laughs> they're, they're so disappointing because they were the they were the pioneers of the 24-hour news cycle. They were the industry leaders on having correspondence on the ground. They had some of the bravest and most outstanding reporters in the world during the Gulf War, people who right. risked their lives to be places that no reporters at the time. You know, like the, the BBC reporters at, you know, the British Embassy in Tel Aviv reporting on the Iraq War. CNN is, like, you know, embedded with the troops and the front line. Right. You know, and to go from that to... 
a story getting retracted every five minutes because they've made another mistake with their friend of a friend sourcing. It's and it has to go back to the the attention span of of the actual news reader too because our attention spans last maybe a week, you know. And I was reading an article about this last week. You know, where is the ongoing news about the um, shooting in Las Vegas? You know, that's never been wrapped up. You know, we haven't no, gotten just, any information about the shooter. We, we no, have no it's information gone. about the motivation. But it's out of our minds because yeah, and it's one of the been like twenty news cycles since. It's one of the worst things that's ever happened in America. It's the worst mass shooting of all time in America. Or maybe, in, I don't know if in the world, but definitely. Weird. America. It well, just yeah, disappeared. Yeah. It just disappeared. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, rank, yeah. I'm ranking it. I'm ranking it behind, you know, like things like Pearl Harbor and 9/11. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like one of the worst but, things of all time. Like, obviously, in terms of shootings, it's literally the worst. The, there's I mean, like three. There's three different narratives. Narratives of, yeah. uh, from the police about what happened to yeah. how the guy died. We don't even know any backstory about this guy. The other we don't people. even have. Any, we don't even have any security footage about of the guy yeah. walking into the into the hotel. And you, you know why we don't have it? Because nobody's asking any questions because it's already old news two months later. And it's the one of the worst shootings of all time. I've said so, this before and I'll say it again. And if anyone does want to read um, the writings of someone who existed in the proper news era, um, John Pilger is someone I recommend enormously. I think when he passes away, it'll be the end of the era of the great correspondents who... Um, were the kind of British newsman of the old era. He's Australian, but he spent most of his career in Britain. Um, who would, you know, they wouldn't go and write a, a broadsheet editorial on the basis of a few tweets and a quick phone call with someone. He would spend two months embedded and researching in a country abroad, and then then the story would come out with all that information and all that research and all that hard work. And I think when when people like him are gone, they're the last generation of great correspondents and real, real newsmen. And, um, obviously, because of the era, less newswomen from that era. Um, but once they're gone, that's the that really is the end of an era where a phone call and a rumor is news now. Yeah, my my sense is that good news would 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 appear if the people wanted it, and they don't because their interests are elsewhere. And uh, it's, people, it's people, sad. People are, people are um, it's not a news issue, it's a, it's the way we're programming people through, and Garrett and I were watching some of the videos that Anonymous put out um, about the social networks where all the people that used to work there now have realized what they, what they did. Because um, they play on the same addictions and psychology that... Yeah. Uh, and if you're a cynical marketer, you should you should listen to this and think yes. about how you can use you're it. You're going to learn a lot that. because they yeah. straight up say how if you want to learn how to take a thousand person viewer base and turn it into a million, psychology. And that's all they do. It's echo chamber after echo chamber after yeah. can I attack you on this and you're not even going to know it. And can I do this in the new? It's amazing. And, um, yeah. And if we compare, if we compare ourselves to the generation, uh, Previous to us, I'm sure they look at us like like we're. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Like, no, I, mean, I mean, us three. They look at us and think, "Wow, these these guys these guys could belong." <laughs> <laughs> I hope. I hope. I hope. But, I don't know. I, th I think we're pretty uh, pretty grounded, and we can do our research and uh, think deeply about things. I don't, know. I don't even have cable. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> people don't people don't think deeply about anything anymore. No. no. It, 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 uh, it's disappointing because it, it translates pretty heavy into a lot of the SEO shit I see on Facebook where it's like I don't mean to attack gurus even though I, I'll come out and say it stop listening to these guys because you're wasting time but people are just like oh he said something so I have to agree with it and I'm gonna agree with it I'm not gonna like anybody that says anything else. I'm just going to delete them off Facebook or unfollow. The the, the the echo chamber shit on uh, on social media is is just, is out of control right now, and it's really infuriating. Because if you try to have an intelligent discussion, you kind of realize no. that you're talking to a brick yeah. wall. 
Yeah, because and, you're, uh, you're, you're talking to everybody else that already agrees with you, and then like that one person comes in to disagree, whether it's like a yeah. absentine disagreement or something that is warranted. Um, everyone just gangs up on him, like, "Oh no, yeah. you're, you're bigoted, you're racist, you're this, you're that," and it's just like, "Well, no, someone just had a differing, a different point of view." And maybe I want I wanna, I wanna, speaking of this discussion, I want to know, and if there are any Googlers watching, if someone could uh, let us know, is it true that at Google, someone who claimed to identify as an ornate building presented to, to people at Google? Because honestly, I think that's a cry for help. The person needs some kind of psychological help, a psychiatrist, maybe medication. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can't identify as a building. It's literally not possible <laughs> if you're in sound mental health to believe that you are an ornate building. And if that makes me a bigot, then, you know, <laughs> I'm pretty open. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I, in terms of people doing whatever the hell they want, I'm extremely liberal. I mean... <laughs> I you don't know, I mean, give a stuff, shit stuff, what stuff, you do. Some of the stuff Ben gets up to, I mean, you know, Garrett, like, <laughs> we, we were quite happy for him to do it, you know? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> he's a straight-edge extremist over there, Ben, drinking his nice wine and chilling while I'm drinking my uh, God knows what that a uh, delivery brought me today. Um, oh, but yeah, like, I just, if that actually happened, that's just a classic example of, you know, a message just getting echoed worse and worse. So it starts off with something really simple, like, uh, you know, we should be more tolerant of people who have different, you know, identify differently than us. Who doesn't agree with that? That just makes sense. Like, just if someone has different feelings about who they are, you yeah. should respect them. And then you then then you get a guy. I don't even know if it was a guy because it didn't say in the article. It could be a could be a woman, I guess. But, um, identifies as an ornate building presenting at a company event, and I'd love to know if that's true or not. Um, I guess we may find out in discovery if that that lawsuit goes through, um, but that's an echo chamber um, just going to the extreme result of where just yeah. oh yeah we, well if we accept this then we have to accept complete lunacy as being a valid opinion that someone can have or you're a bigot. It's like what no <laughs> look, some some people just need help like they've yeah. lost their fucking minds. But on that note, I think we're going to move on a little yeah. bit here. Yeah, I just pasted up. Ben's going to do a review on a chair. I bought one for uh, Megan, but I don't really sit on it. I like it. Ben's been sitting on it, so he can tell you. Yeah, it so it's uh, the Ergo Chair Number 2 by Autonomous.ai. And this was one of these Kickstarter brands that they launched uh, one product, and then they kind of uh, scaled into all kinds of smart uh, office uh, furniture, but uh, I got it. Did, did they start with the desk or did they start with the chair? Um, I'm not sure, but they did the adjustable standing sitting desk. But that's I think they started with the desks. Yeah. I saw their desk first before you had the chair and stuff. So Gary told me about the chair a couple weeks or months ago, and uh, you know, I was looking at one of the Herman Miller chairs because in the SEO community, everybody has Herman Miller uh, and body or the era. And they're like a thousand bucks starting, and um, they're really good. I mean, the quality is there; it's, it's worth every dollar. But I couldn't bring myself to drop like twelve hundred bucks on an office chair. Um, but I did realize that I was using my chair from high school, and I'm in you know in front of the I'm in front of the computer like eight to ten hours a day. So I should probably get something ergonomic that that's really comfortable. And everything I read on, on online about the ergo chair was uh, comparing it to the Herman Miller chairs. So uh, I took a shot on it, 250 bucks. Uh, it was here in about two weeks. It took about 20 minutes, 30 minutes to put together. And it's comfortable as hell. And um, you can adjust it to high heaven to, to any uh, preferred specification that you want. And uh, Does your chair go up and down quite a bit? I can hit a button and make it go up and down. It doesn't. Well, how down. far does because Megan's chair? Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Max to min. Yeah. All right. Let me figure this out here. Yeah, I know there's that's, a lot of buttons. There's like twenty fucking levers. Yeah, that, that's max. And we're gonna go all, all the right, way down. Slide all the way down. And that, that's min. So it's only about six inches. Half, yeah, okay. half a foot. Yeah, half yeah. a foot. I, I think the previous version that we have upstairs 
it's like legit maybe three inches, and that's that's the only thing. My chair is still getting shape, but uh, I would have bought another one right away. But I was really pissed that the one upstairs goes down like two inches, and because I'm tall, like I needed to go down. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually, I, I'm, I'm, I'm six one, and I. I keep it at its at the highest level, um, okay, yeah. so so I think it should be fine. But you can adjust everything. The um, the arms go left and right, front and back. They actually kind of adjust that way too. Yep. Um, the seat goes tilt front and back. Uh, you can lean way the hell back on this. I don't know. Yeah. And uh, it's awesome, and it's really comfortable. So for two hundred fifty bucks, it rivals Herman Miller. You can't beat it. Yeah, that's cool. I'm I, I'm gonna end up getting one. I just didn't get one the other day because I raged at their uh, price gouging of UK customers. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. If you guys Actually, like listening, like yeah, that's the other call. thing. The, the customer service was great. They emailed me like 15 times, and it was like a person, an actual yeah. person, emailing me, just letting me know I'm what was going on. Get, uh, I'm tempted to get PewDiePie's chair. I can't remember the brand now. I'm gonna have to check his. Uh, he's got like his office setup video. He has so much stuff. Like the stuff in his uh, office must be worth like thirty thousand dollars or something. It's like, hey man, I, I'm not a gamer. I like I play guitar. As you, you can see, but I don't really spend money on that. So if I'm gonna spend money in, on it. Might as well be office equipment, you know. Yeah. yeah as soon as this chair wears out, probably. I've had this one for a couple of years, and this is like the first like normal office chair that. Has actually held up for me. I think probably within the year I'll get another autonomous chair. And I might get oh, a standing desk, but I don't know. We'll see. I, yeah, I tried would... the standing thing. I, I, I can do phone calls standing up. As soon as I'm standing up, I start pacing around. Like I, yeah, I, like yeah, I, I, I do the same shit. And I, I kept finding myself not in the room anymore, yeah. which is, which isn't very really productive. For, isn't very really productive for work. That, that's what I do. I have my upstairs hallway right here, so anytime I'm on a phone call, I just yeah. pace up and down the, uh, yeah. up and down the hallway. Yeah, I, I just but, walk uh, around the basement and fucking. I, I think the rule of thumb is like every hour, every two hours, you should get up and walk around for like ten minutes. So we just got a puppy, so I just take him out. Yeah, take him out yeah. to the backyard, and and that's it. You know. So I'm getting my 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 uh, required motion in, but yeah, <laughs> I do recommend this chair. Looks very comfortable, actually. For sure. So yeah. don't tweet this. Who's up? Uh, Steve. Uh, I, I've got, I've got one. Our, our conversation earlier prompted me to it. Just talking about yeah, uh, thinking more deeply about link building and ego baiting and stuff like that. So back when I did my uh, crash course guide on Builder Society, let me just drag it over. Um, I set some homework, and this shows this shows just to Vin's point earlier actually how. We don't have to worry about this magic tool becoming available that gives people information for free and they're definitely going to use it because I offered anyone who messaged me on LinkedIn or Twitter um, who'd done the homework that, or maybe it was so easy that everyone just got the answer straight away and they, they're all just <laughs> printing millions of links with it. I, I said I would tell them the real answer. So, um, so here's what I said originally. Thinking about how to do an idea better than the original poster is an important part of what I'm teaching here. So let's try one. You've just read a post about how in tough niches, for example, drug treatment, an award given by your treatment center, for example, top 10 cocaine addiction blogs, to top blogs in the niche is a great way to get links, as people often link to people that link to and, link to and share their awards. Um, so that's just your typical bullshit award. You do 10 awards, 10 sites, top 10 cocaine blogs, whatever, write to them all saying you've won our award, give them a badge, they put it on or whatever. What? Two things would you do to increase the number of links you got? And I even give them hints. By choosing better sites to target than your competition and by getting extra links by mixing in another strategy on top. Um, what, two things? Two things, yeah. So the first one is to find better sites to target than your competition. And the second thing is to get extra links by mixing another standard um, outreach strategy on top. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm going to tell you the answers today. The uh, t Okay, so basically what most people do when they do this is they actually give awards to the 10 best cocaine addiction blogs that they find, which is straight up stupid. 
Absolutely. <laughs> one out of but one why out would of that be? Because they just go on, they're like, oh, we're going to do this award, and they just find 10 that have got traffic, and they're like, oh, I'd love links from these 10. Let's just do these 10. So then they try and pitch them, and they get people writing back that hate drug treatment. They realize it's a scam. They hate you. They just ignore your email because they get so many pitches because they're a big site. So what you actually do is you find every single blog that's ever been given an award in the space, get them all in one massive fuck-off spreadsheet, and then you look at, you find all the ones that have linked to at least two to three of their previous awards, and you give all of those an award. So you only give your award to fuckers that link to it. And instead of getting one link per 10 on your award, or you have to do like a list of 100 and get into 10 different categories to get 10 links, you probably get four or five links right away from that. So the next step, once you've done that, so how do we get, how well, do we mix in and... Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause you because I just saw a lot of people on Facebook selling link roundup links all of a sudden. <laughs> it's not like it's a 10-year-old idea and it's probably okay now. But uh, if anybody's watching, if you want to actually know how to do a link roundup stuff under the radar, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. What, like an expert roundup? Is that, is that what you mean? They're selling that as a service? Uh, not an expert roundup. I'm going to reach out to 10 DA15 gardening blogs and make sure that uh, we're going to put together a, a 10 picture slideshow and make a roundup. And, uh, uh, <laughs> God. and it's yeah. the same. Oh, yeah, that's the same game as he, um, Viper Chill's talking about. Like all the links to those rounded up posts and no followed. Yeah. Or the JavaScript. Yeah. Um, I mean, actually, what we used to do back in the old days was um, use JavaScript obfuscation of the links. So you would click it, and it would work because the JavaScript would handle it, but you deliberately use such fucked up JavaScript that Google's JavaScript <laughs> engine couldn't figure out that it was a link. Um, I believe that there's no way to click Google anymore easily, but certainly not with uh, my coding skills. Uh, and we wouldn't do that kind of tactic now anyway. I mean, no. I think the... The so idea a, a decade in the past here. Yeah, yeah, it was 10 <laughs> years ago shit, but it's kind of funny seeing uh, Viper Chill talking about 10 years old shit, and it's like what people are doing now. It's like no one no one in this industry learns anything, and everyone starts as if they're new. They don't read any resources. They don't learn from what people did before, and they're out there doing no-follow JavaScript obfuscated sliders of roundups and then trying to get the people to link to oh you were mentioned in our weekly roundup do you want to share it kind of nonsense it's like oh. but anyway so yeah so we're going to take another really obvious um link building outreach strategy that everyone does and we're just going to mix it with this uh top 10 so we get our four links in because we've picked people that tend to link to their awards and the six that are left we know that they open their emails and look at when they've won awards because we've done the first step but they haven't linked to it just automatically. So maybe we haven't got any credibility. Maybe they aren't excited about us. So we write to them and offer our highest ranking member of staff. So, uh, you know, usually some kind of doctor with really good credentials from a top school, you know, one of the medical professionals at the treatment center. You write to them and say, hey, congratulations on winning the award. Here's your award. We're going to have this amazing person write for your blog for free. And during the post, of course, they're going to mention that you won our award and why you won it. And during the bit when he mentions their award or she mentions their award and why they won it, they're going to link to the award, aren't they? Yeah. So you use the you leverage the medical authority at the, the center to to pitch to get them in, and then you get another three links from that. So suddenly you've gone from this bullshit strategy that everyone's doing and copying. We'll just give 10 reviews to do a best 10 of this, best 10 of this, and you get one to two links every time. Suddenly we're getting six links, seven links of the same exact fucking strategy just by thinking deeply about how to mix things together. And that's my don't tweet this. That was my homework on the crash course, which I wrote on November 24th, 2015. All of you guys could have had the answer if you'd thought about it for a couple of, maybe you all did. Maybe it was just like so fucking obvious that they were the two things I was talking about. Cause I mean, Garrett was, Garrett got the first one in half a second. So um, but you'd hope so, considering that's what we do for a living. But anyway, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, maybe it was so obvious, but if it wasn't obvious to you and you didn't reach out to me, you, now you know. Um, 
the whole rest of the guide is full of tips like that. This whole ego baiting was in the guide. If you just read it through properly and think deeply for probably half an hour for every paragraph, you'll, uh, you'll uncover some really interesting gems that I hid in there for you. Um, the homework should give you, that should be enough of a clue about how you need to think about the strategy to unlock the rest of the gems i will not be revealing any more of them on don't tweet this is on the show though this is uh as, as vin warned me about earlier this is a unique show <laughs> where revealed informations there you uh, go but i mean that's not something we do anymore because we don't do direct client work so we can rarely uh publish anything on the client site let alone a a bunch of awards that they don't want to give um but if you've got your own business or you're doing your own seo consulting this is exactly the kind of magic you can work. It's ego bait. Read through the rest of the guide and add these strategies to all the other stuff you're doing. And um, when you get stuck and you need to scale up, give give us a call and I'll uh, I'll work some magic on top for you. Um, yeah, and really step it up. Ah. Uh, uh, buy the buy the merch. Yes. Yeah. Let's sh- let's share that link one more time. Yep. Who's There's some it? really cool, oh, yeah, really cool stuff. There's uh, like hoodies and tote bags, uh, male and female t-shirts. Um, there's a mug which I'll be getting. We got to nail Mr. Jared down on his uh, time slot. Well, I know he's watching right now. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, that's up to him. He might have something going on. So. Oh, there is a uh, bit of there is a bit of demand, uh, Jared. If you're watching, uh, quite a few people have said to me that we should have you on every show. I think they'd like just you, actually, and uh, the three of us to be kicked <laughs> off. The road. It's too too much of an opinionated hour. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I mean they're prepared to put up with us as long as you're on the show, Jared. But <laughs> <laughs> I think Jared would keep us on track with the SEO topics before we go off into uh, you know frequent flyer miles and and well, uh, what that's happens. valuable stuff to the SEO community. How many people <laughs> do you see flying to Thailand because they can't afford to live in America? We are, <laughs> we are we are a community where we have a lot of conferences and. There's a lot of opportunity to learn, and if people go out and about a bit more and met people that actually knew what they were doing, there'd be a lot less people struggling. So, you know, yeah. come along to some conferences where there's some people, hang out, go to the bar, have some drinks, actually talk shop. Yeah, you'll learn so much. It's unreal. And there's so many great people in this industry that are prepared to be your mentor. Um, you'll get away from the the shysters and the gurus really, really quickly once you learn what you're doing. I mean, I see people still struggling with local SEO. It's insane. I mean, Garrett and I were chatting about that recently. It's like, you just need citations, a few good links, and a bit of content, and just keep churning that out a little bit every month. Take money to the bank, clients killing it. Yeah. Build a foundation that you'd be willing to put your kids on in your house. And you keep building on that. You're, you're untouchable forever versus... Yeah, you might get some shit for a few months, and cool. The house yeah. just imploded, you know? It's like, fuck. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it takes a little bit longer. You have to forego with some income. But, hey, the whole deal is you're building an empire, right? Whether you're a small business or you're looking to make a conglomerate worldwide. Long-term thinking. Short-term, yeah, you need to make money. But, that's uh, the whole. That's the old uh, blue hat SEO concept. Yeah. Every everything you do has to make money, but it's long term, and it's all gonna uh, lead to the uh, the end game. Yeah. So yeah, yeah if you need to go get a second job to make an extra thousand bucks a month, do it because it's gonna be more valuable in the next ten years versus yeah, you made twelve thousand dollars less focusing on your sites, but I don't, I don't I guess I don't know how to put it into words, like do what you need to do, but be appropriate about it. Well, I mean, a lot of people would be better off working and investing, like living like a chump and learning the strategies and investing most of their money in like content from word agents. And I was chatting to a client about well, it. Yeah, today. it's the same with like and anything. And he was like, well, how does this, why don't you write them with your writers and stuff and do the link base yourself? And I was like, well, we started using word agents for these link baits, these premium link baits, and we always end up overshooting the link target by one, two links. And Vin knows it for his own sites that we work on. We always over deliver on what he's ordered because 
the shit stuff that people want to link to. And I think people try and save money um, at the end of a year, like on an order of 10 a month, one of Vin sites, for example, I, I know you don't order that exact amount, but just to make it easy for people, if you're getting between a 10 and 30%, so an average of two extra links, over the year, you've got 24 extra links. Right. And that's a fortune in money. Yeah. And Money you're and trying to value save, people, are, people are trying to save a, people are trying to save a penny a word and nickel and diming Vin, but they're, they're throwing away two three thousand dollars worth of extra results. And then yeah. for well, those links, that's not just what they're throwing away. They've, they've saved that money on. The I mean, I mean that, that kind of stuff just comes from the ignorance of somebody that isn't a service provider. They don't know that kind of thing. But yeah, you, you're you're right in what you're saying. Well, I think what I'm trying to say is more like um, around what, um, and I know we've stopped doing this meme, but more around what Gary Vaynerchuk's talking about when he he doesn't like to do anything that he's shit at. Like if someone asks him a question about well, how, the stock market, he's, he's like, getting pretty good at doing stuff he's shit at. He is. Because he's uh, writing books about, I don't know what I'm doing, but you should make money out of it. Gary Vaynerchuk. Yeah. You've said it yourself on the show. No, no, that was uh, Russell Brunson's expert secret. Gary said it too. When did he say that? I didn't he... say he said it, so if he has said it, it wasn't quoted by me. No, I think it has. Expert, expert secrets is when uh, Russell kind of was like, oh, yeah. Oh, and uh, Neil Patel did that as well with his, uh, oh, don't worry about if you can do a webinar. Just make one anyway and charge people $400. And... But, yeah, no, I mean, like, Gary's like, if you ask him about the, uh, the stock market, he always says, oh, I don't know, or politics. He's like, nah. but if you ask him about social media, then obviously that's what he wants to talk about. He doesn't want to, he doesn't get involved in the finances of the business. He doesn't get involved in the legal stuff. He doesn't get, you know, there's a whole list of things he deliberately blacklists himself from. And yet, you know, whatever you think about him, he started two companies that have worked, that turn over. You know, the smallest one is the wine business, which does like 70 million or whatever. And the biggest one's VaynerMedia that does 300 million or whatever. He's built two pretty huge businesses. Um, if you imagine yourself, as, even if you imagine yourself being equally talented at building businesses, you can't imagine that you have more skills across every spectrum. But you have people trying to build everything by themselves and they try and do everything. And it's just impossible. Like, I can't yeah. draw. If drawing was one of the things we had to do to make money, and I was doing that for the business, my sketches look like a, like a four-year-old child drew them. Like, you well, should see the yeah, stuff. Yeah. I, I can't draw see, either. You should see the stuff I sent to the, the dev team. Like, when I'm sketching out a page or some design I want, it just looks like just... I don't know how, I don't know how we got T-shirts back from the sketches I sent. I, I'm well, amazed that we have merch. It just shows how good no, designers we are dealing with people that are idiots. But like, hey, I, I think the search never sleeps it is the coolest yeah. SEO tagline yeah. that I've ever heard. <laughs> that's that's awesome. Yeah, I was pretty but, pleased with myself for. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I, I I really like the branding. I think for the time we had to work on it, I think it's really cool. I think it's. I I'm really looking forward to doing this annually, and I'm looking forward to our uh, yeah. October live event, which we're definitely going to run if this goes well. So that's another reason to make this go really well for us, guys. Get donating. Um, like I say, Garrett and I got it started today. Um, hopefully a lot of the other speakers will jump in and make some donations as well before we get live. Um, but live, like if you want to give a dollar, you want to give a hundred dollars, whatever you can give. I mean, we're literally giving you... If you bought a video pack from a conference that had this lineup of speakers, you'd be paying $250. If you can give a hundred dollars to Fuck, Jews, from what I've seen, fuck, this would cost yeah, twenty five thousand no, dollars. Jesus well, Christ! Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've actually got better speakers because um, we haven't just got famous people. I mean, people like uh, I mean, he is famous ish in the industry. I mean, Paul Shapiro, well, for example, but he's not. I've been trying to like, pick out people that don't get to talk because they're actually making money. You know, it's like, but yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, someone like Paul Shapiro. He, extremely well known in the technical SEO industry but it's kind of it's not exciting that, you know, anyways it's, um, it's going to be a good event we'll cover it up next week um, we're about to finish the site up um, in the next couple of days going to get uh, social media pretty huge so let's uh, keep running her and um, yeah I guess that's all we have for get the short night 
get registered. Don't smash the like button this week. Don't comment. I smash the shit out of like them. Call Steve. I'm going to give Steve's probably cell phone number. And smash that motherfucking donate button. <laughs> and when you, see, when you see the advertisement on Facebook this week, share it to all your friends, too. Yes. Yeah, share it on Facebook. Yeah, legit. Um, next, The next month is about sharing, caring, giving. So, fuck the show. Uh, share the event. We're not profiting it from at all, so... None of the speakers are. It's really amazing. Um, yeah. So many big names. Yeah, no one knows. Just, People that get billed, you know, they bill out for tens of thousands of dollars to speak for 20 minutes at a big conference. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, ungagged and stuff like that. We've got big speakers like that on the list. You've seen them already on the website, the featured speakers. They're giving up their time for free, sometimes at crazy yeah. times at night. You're, you're getting free value on something you'd have to spend 1500 bucks to go to ungagged. And yeah. Everyone's giving up for free. It's going to be good shit. Is it going to be shit that I've made them talk about that they don't normally talk about? So, regardless if it's directly applicable to SEO, it's going to be really good stuff they need to learn about growing business or doing this or doing that. It's going to be awesome. It's going to, a whole day of this shit, you get to watch me. So. <laughs> And they, well, Vin and I are going to be around. I mean, yeah, we're, we'll be around. Yeah. We're not going to hog. Gonna, we're not going to hog the limelight. We're going to. Um, Garrett's going to choose when he uh, when he feels we're worthy of some airtime. He'll bring us in. To, yeah, I'm going to uh, take a few uh, breaks. You know, I, I got to take a piss once in a while. Yeah. Anyways, Vin and I are going to be there the whole 24 hours. Um, yeah. yeah. Mostly, we're going to be moderating the chat. We'll jump in for a few of the speakers. There's a couple that I really want to um, say hi to. Um, I'm really excited about the day, to be honest. I think it's going to be better than any of the conferences we've been to because um, it's such a mix. We've got some black hat. We've got some technical SEO. And especially the technical SEO, some of the stuff that they're going to be sharing, just like super deep. It's not um, stuff that's even talked about, honestly. It's... Um... It's and we're not trying, to, not trying to sell you anything either. We're just no. like, all the money's going to charity, so it's you, it's you know the stuff like I talk about saying I just don't pay attention to it, and it, it's my own wrong fault. I should be paying attention to stuff, but it's also stuff. There's a few guys on this lineup that are really, really good at some technical stuff that you need to pay attention to. So. Um, I don't know. Vin and Jared keep us in the loop on the technical stuff. We can well, the, the, there, <laughs> there's going to be a couple things that um, need to go over. Anyways, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Share the event. It's going to be big, like we just said. We're out of here. It's All right, sucks. guys. See you next week. Bye, guys. Yeah. See you next week.